to this, there's two separate lines, but completely complementary, completely intertwined. One is that I'm doing a series of articles for Australian media, financial, tech, societal media, about this whole question of where we're at and is tech is tech the villain or a potential savior? Are we the villains ourselves? Right? Um, and this other sort of ambitious project I'm working on globally, which is the New World Fair. And and for our conversation today in this 30 minutes, they will be completely interchangeable because of the very same questions that I ask and you're asking. And so I just want to dive in. I want to dive in. Um, and I want to start. There's so many ways I could start with you. Um, but I want to start with your self, your, your, your self-description of your role. Okay, I'm a lowercase minister, I'm a poetician, I'm a uh, person that makes plurality out of singularity. Yes, so love all that, love it, but I want to really go to the words that I've, I've seen written about you and also that you wrote in, uh, that you mentioned in a, in a, in a, te in a TEDx thing because it's so, it's, it's so profound and, and personal to me for, for a couple of reasons, which I'll explain. So I'm just going to go to that right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to uh, tell them back to you, which is when you see the internet of things, mm -hmm. make it the internet of beings. When you see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we say mission learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we say user experience, let's make it about human experience. And when we say the singularity is near, let us all remember that plurality is here. I really, really love it. Um, and I got to tell you that it was an affirmation of stuff that I've been struggling with for ages is because as a writer um, that has been invested in policy and politics and tech for many, many years. When you write stuff that tries to put human beings at the center of your desire to act, there is a lot of like, man, there's a lot, there's a lot of pushback about that. It's like mm -hmm. we don't understand the world or something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How do we overcome that? And what and and in your experience, like you know, what advice would you have for me and New World Fair that we literally want to put humanity at the center of the of the tools and services that that, that this technocracy can allow us to have? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, there's a long tradition of confusing the categories. For example, people are talking about incentivizing companies, but companies are fictions. They really couldn't be incentivized. And on the other and people talk about human resource uh, as if, you know, uh, we're soil and green or something. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so I think a uh, profound, um, like, disorientation around categories um, is at hand, and which is why I think uh, paying attention to the vocabulary uh, really matters. And mm -hmm. I've discovered that um, many people actually are... Um, very keen to use these ideas, uh, this collaborative learning, or as I call it, assistive intelligence rather than authoritarian intelligence, if you make it uh, the analogy um, close enough to, to home. For example, when I talk about collaborative learning or assistive intelligence, I often invoke the metaphor of fire because, first of all, fire is dangerous, it destroys entire cities. Um, second, uh, the fire is an important part of civilization because it enables batch processing of digestive cooking functions. Um, <laughs> AI enable batch processing of cognitive functions. And third, we don't actually limit fire use to just a few technicians. Uh, instead, we teach how to use fire responsibly uh, as young as six years old. It's called cooking classes uh, and enable us to share recipes and share you know, the cooking experience together, which is the fabric of civilization. Now, with this analogy, people understand assistive intelligence as contrary to the authority Tearing one very well. So I guess just, just a few analogies would help a lot to go a long way. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because I think the people 
you know, people that are not leaders, mm-hmm. right? When you when you group with them, when you travel, when whatever, you actually find out that we've got more in common than less in common. Mm-hmm. And it really is about food, love, uh ideas uh feeling good about purpose purpose driven mm-hmm. life that's right do you feel like is there a turning point or a tipping point not just in taiwan because i know because mm-hmm. i know you've focused on your work in taiwan but you're also like you know you're mm-hmm. you're getting to the heart of global issues east west as mm-hmm. well mm-hmm. right do you think we're at a tipping point that there's real opportunity? And I'm not just talking about optimism versus cynicism. I'm talking about in your 39 years, mm-hmm. is it something that you feel that we have an extraordinary tipping point now where we can Definitely. really? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, um, it used to be that on the more anti-social side of social media, it travels not only on outrage or revenge or discrimination, but also uh, those um, emotions were triggered uh, by this showing off uh, culture of people uh, looking at Instagram, looking at social media, and see a, a gilded age and compare it uh, with their everyday uh, life and see a, a profound disempowerment as opposed to empowerment uh, when uh, interfacing uh, with so many more superficial part of the society. However, during the COVID, uh, globally, it's not just in Taiwan, but globally, uh, those uh, ideas that grew was about altruism, was about protecting the vulnerable, uh, was about, well, there was some blaming about outsiders and so on, but it's not so much about a status competition anymore. Uh, actually, it's considered bad taste to, to show off during a COVID, uh, no matter which status symbol one uses. And it brings together on the same urgency the parts of the world that previously wouldn't talk to one another because of time zone, because of cultural differences and so on, because everyone is sharing the same playbook uh, that has a variation and sometimes successfully, sometimes successful for a while and so on, but everyone could feel the urgency, the same urgency. So I, I do think COVID is a really, really big tipping point, more so than climate change, because for climate change, um, the continental and the Atlantic countries sometimes do not feel it on the same um, time scale, but, but COVID is the same time scale for everyone. So I, I do think with the hindsight of 2020, pun intended, we're, we're not much more prepare for this global solidarity yeah i mean i i hear all i hear all that and one of the things that i heard in that too was you know it constantly and i think it goes to this plurality concept Mm -hmm. right but it also goes to this idea of globalization so Mm -hmm. you know scholarship and politicization of has said over the last 10 years, whether it's been Brexit or whether it's Trump or whatever, the globalization has failed us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? Right? And and you know, um I, I I I'm really interested in the idea of plurality and global progress that can be imagined without this division. Again, getting back to sort of what our shared values are. And I really, really loved what you're already learning about polis polis in Taiwan. You know, the simple, I know there's a lot more to it than this, but the simple act of actually getting rid of a Mm -hmm. like reply button literally takes out a lot of the noise and a lot of, this the stuff so is where do you land on globalization and what we've learned about it the pros cons and the good the bad the ugly of it and the way that tech can can we can move forward and 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 uh and and not hate globalization but still progress as a humanity in our specific cultures and countries yes um i think um there's this um, 
word uh, that I use, transculturalism, um, that I think symbolizes what polis and other processes is all about. Because this is all about looking at our own upbringing as individuals from the communities that we were detached or distanced from or vilified, right? Um, mm -hmm. But if we can uh, go through this transcultural journey, then we end up learning more about ourselves because th those different perspectives, they are right. um, very much legitimate and share the same goals and sometimes offer, actually always offer uh, better imaginations or alternate imaginations of how to reach those goals also held dear by us, but we were constrained about the one culture uh, that our upbringing uh, re restrict us too, right? So, so this transcultural journey, I think, is what people feel profoundly, uh, no matter whether this is looking at a police report uh, or looking at uh, us from the VR of the space station and so on. It gives a holistic uh, overview effect of things, and that's the transcultural experience. Yeah, and you know what? It just reminded me of something that I was going to bring up later, but I actually think it's really important, and again, it's very important to the team at New World Fair is what we're really about is, um, I, I guess, understanding exponentiality, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Exponentiality of systems and technologies, putting humans at the, at the center of that. It is actually very, very difficult to visualize exponentiality or to show it at a glance to mm -hmm. people, yep. right? Um, and I and I loved some of the stuff that you were saying in a couple of talks that I saw you, which is like even with um, with one of the initiatives that you got, where where people can in Taiwan can go like the budget, the the budget thing, <laughs> yeah, taking five hundred PDF freaking pages and putting in a thing where you can drill down, drill down, drill down. Right? What mm. can you tell us about? Where that vi those visual like like better and that reimagining visualization techniques can take you, and what are you most excited about mm -hmm. having seen what that's done in Taiwan? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and sure. With, yeah, where you would like to take it? Because I think this whole thing, when in time in terms of understanding complexity, I would argue that we're not very good at it, mm -hmm. and but yet we really really need to be better at. It. So well, yeah, I, I think it's it's beyond words, right? Because words are linear. Uh, well, I mean, there's some non-linear poetry, but that's not what the government's reports are usually written I, in. I agree. Right. So, so if something is uh, by nature beyond words, trying to capture it with words, I mean, it's a poet's job, but we we don't usually do a very good job at it, as you as you said, right? So uh, much more uh, is needed to immerse uh, oneself in the in the context. For example, computer games. I'm very excited about interactive games uh, that yes. these things. Um, I've personally translated quite a few games from Nikki Case, and they're a uh, what they call interactionable uh, maker uh, that explains, for example, the epidemiology model. Uh, and so uh, in the model called uh, What Happens Next, um, you can actually try the different uh, ideas of fighting COVID, like social distancing, mask use, and so on. Uh, but uh, it's a kind of sandbox. Everyone can try their own uh, policy ideas. Yes, and just in a simulation, understand exponentiality, literally the basic reproduction value of exponential virus growth, right? So, and, and I think this does a pretty good job, I pasted on the chat here, um, of explaining uh, exponentiality. So uh, I think there's three keys. Uh, first, it, it's interactive, means that it's fast, right? If you change a dial, you get um, a response immediately. Um, and uh, it considers all the different options. It's not trying to ram a certain idea like contact tracing uh, down the user's uh, throat. It's actually uh, revealing what the epidemiologists have learned in a sandbox and putting you in charge of ensuring a fair response. And finally, it, it's fun. You can see the comic drawings, uh, the uh, smileys, the, the different uh, moods of people suspectable, exposed, and infectious, and recovered, and so on, which are really beyond words. If you take out all those um, pretty uh, diagrams and faces, and then just with the words, um, infectious or recovered, it will be much more dull. Uh, so the same fast, fair, fun principle also applies here. I really, I really love that. And it, again, it's so resonant to what we're trying to do at New Welfare. One, uh, 
at least one of our co-founders, um, Peter Hirschberg, you you have met at, at, at a number of different conferences before. Um, don't blame me for not remembering. If you do, you do. That's great. But key to new welfare is we want to have the heart of it, some idea of gamification, mm -hmm. small and large, right, about how that we that that where people can come to this and you know it's 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 not sim city it's way bigger than that with the tools of, of today but how we can literally engage with that and see the results of our choices mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what they do yep, yep. and so you think that that is that is possible and probable it is probable. I, I think it does capture people's attention. And uh, we do have very successful cases in Taiwan where, for example, there's a social entrepreneur that made a Pokemon Go game, but instead of collecting Pokemons, it's about uh, refilling your uh, bottle in the drinking fountains and saving plastic use. And the, the notification is about reminding you to drink when there is potential heat damage. And this uh, gold coin that you collected uh, is could be spent on this local social enterprise agricultural projects which then introduce the idea of a reducing carbon footprint uh, by consuming uh, like near a uh, home and so on and, and also the green transition but all this is of course very pedagogical but this is in the shell of a Pokemon Go like game and, and people play it uh, because it's fun not because they want to uh, save plastic but after playing for 50 days they, they save a lot of plastic and reduce a lot of carbon footprint. Yeah, and I and that's so that sort of goes to a bigger question that I have. Like, so at what you're 39, I'm 57, okay. uh, in, in about you know five days. Um, and I'm Australian, you're Taiwanese, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm a wordsmith, um, you're a software mm -hmm. thinker and bigger thinker than that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bucketing us. I we, we've had life experiences that. That take us elsewhere. I want to ask you what you think <coughs> about the idea of tech and how tech has presented mob rule versus mm -hmm. the wisdom of crowds. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about the work that you're doing in Taiwan that is that seems to me to be about more about you can get the wisdom of crowds, not the mob rule? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think my uh, conception of a collaborative learning assistive intelligence is that these are the tools that strengthens the people to people connections uh, so that we work better together because uh, a lot of AI research is uh, replacing human beings or augmenting one single individual so they can do the work of 10,000, not really communicating with that 10,000, right? So uh, it's different um, ideas of uh, tech and tech is never neutral. Tech has a agenda. And so when I said, uh, I consider democracy to be a type of technology, this is a agenda. This is saying social technology, technology that enable communities to work together better and uh, make listening a skill possible so the more people you get the more wisdom it generates that's a position right uh, and I do understand the other position which is of course authoritarian concentrating the data and decision making power and so on and there is of course some uh, attraction at that otherwise we wouldn't be at peak centralization when it comes to social media now that, 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 uh, that's right this, yeah, this yeah. Idea, I mean, one of the big, one of the biggest misunderstandings of the internet and how it evolved since what I would call the commercialization of the internet post 1998, mm -hmm. 2000, 2005, is that everybody likes to think it's distributed. To a certain extent, it is, but it's massive centralization in the hands of of, of a few. Definitely, and, yes. And, and I, I mean, I've uh, read a few articles recently uh, describing our work. Uh, one is a pretty good one about, uh, I think it's on the Atlantic, uh, of how to put out democracy's dumpster file. Uh, and so uh, the tagline is, uh, there's how to fix the internet kleptocracy <clears throat> that profits from disinformation, polarization, and rage. <clears throat> and uh, in that article is a comparison 
of the number of people using Polis or join platform and so on, which even with 10 million visitors, it's true that people only contribute when there is an emerging issue that they talk about. Uh, right. but uh, they, of course, spend more time on Facebook and Instagram and friends. And But I think uh, one of the perspectives I want to offer is that it's not really in competition with one another, right? People spend time on, on in town halls, in national parks, in public libraries, uh, but it's by far not what they spend most of their time on. Um, it's the time that we dedicate our quality thinking to public life to be one with our community and have a conversation with the community. So by nature, it couldn't be 24 hours a day. It could just be about the things that we care about. And that's entirely fine. What's not fine is that people are missing uh, the digital public infrastructure and using the private infrastructure designed for, I don't know, it's not like a nightclub, right, uh, for gossiping, addictive right. drinks, private bouncers, and use that as a town hall. That's the, the problem. But if we have digital town halls, digital national parks, um, I'm not saying that it should supplement or replace because it's definitely on different domains and I'm not uh, against uh, Facebook and so on. But we really do need to look into this re-decentralization. I, I mean, I absolutely agree with that, and there's just so much to talk about that, and I hope to have that opportunity with you in time to come. You know, and so, but I have to ask you, I mean, this is the journalist in me, mm -hmm. I have to ask you, like, when you've got all these debates in mm -hmm. Europe and Asia and Australia mm -hmm. and even the U.S. about about whether we break up big tech, whether we do, whether we 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 call it a utility, you yes. know, a utility, whatever. Where do you think we're going wrong in how we're compartmentalizing those problems? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do you think we're right and where do you think we're wrong? Because it's messy, man. And and not to mention that like all good intentions, like the world is paved with good intentions, right? So regulatory control of breaking up stuff like Google or Facebook or these centralized, these centralized authorities, there's a lot of unintended consequences that we can, that yeah. some of us can see, yes. right? Right. Where so do you stand on that? My staff just reminded that I need to run because the president is uh, visiting in like two minutes from now. But uh, the, the, the main idea here is democracy. Um, the algorithm that sorts the newsfeed is actually fine if people co-create it. Um, the idea is that the Section uh, 230 uh, is there to prevent, um, you know, uh, undue control by the uh, state to how the community regulates one another would be fine if not for the peak centralization. So, so I think that what we're missing really uh, is just a way for people to participate in the governance. And if we can solve this participatory governance issue, then most of the issues that concerns this uh, externality managed by the state will probably go away automatically. This is what we call people-public-private partnerships or so social sector first approach. And I really need to run, sorry about that. And we can follow up on emails and such. We thank will. You. We will. And thank you so much and have a fantastic day. You okay. too. Bye. Bye.